White Sands Beach near St David's has attracted visitors for generations. Set in the spectacular Pembrokeshire Coast National Park, it's an idyllic setting for day trips and holidays. But in 2014, when severe storms pounded the bay, the makings of a mystery were suddenly and shockingly revealed. The wind whipped at the beach and powerful waves crashed against the dunes, stripping the sand away. Even the huge protective boulders were thrown aside. And as the storms began to fade and people returned to the beach, some startling discoveries were made. On a site known for surfing and picnics, visitors now found human remains. Some bones stuck out of the dunes, others were loose on the beach, but all hinted at secrets deep in the sand. Although it had been long known that the site had once housed a small chapel and some bones and medieval items had been found before, the storms uncovered a great many remains. The chapel and whatever lie under it were demanding a closer look. The first written evidence of a chapel here dates to 1603, when the Welsh antiquary George Owen wrote in the description of Pembrokeshire. Not far off is Capel Patrick, full west of St David's, and placed as near his country, namely Ireland, as it could well be. It is now wholly decayed. Over time though, as the relentless windblown sand covered the site, the decayed chapel eventually disappeared from view and from memory. In 2014, very big winter storms battered the west coast of Wales and the coast of Britain and quite badly damaged the site of St Patrick's Chapel, exposing uh, previously unseen remains. So at that point we decided we had to excavate the site because of the changing climate, we're going to get higher sea levels, more frequent storms, which is just going to cause more and more damage to the site. So this excavation was done with both the support of the National Park Authority and CADU. The chapel site lies at Britain's western edge, where the Atlantic and Irish Sea meet. Its association with the cult of St Patrick, Ireland's patron saint, is one of the many ancient connections between Wales and Ireland at the dawn of Christianity, and the bay was a point of departure and arrival for those travelling to and from Ireland and the north. According to myth, St Patrick himself even sailed from here to evangelise Ireland after an angel ousted him from the locality in favour of St David. We know of lots of early medieval cemetery sites across the coast of Pembrokeshire and across the whole of West Wales in general. And they are very much a coastal distribution we have here. But also we know of lots of early uh, sites which have medieval incised crosses on them, uh, stones with incised crosses and also stones with inscriptions as well. But what's very really unusual about St Patrick's Chapel is it's in windblown sand and that preserves the bones. And so most cemetery sites you find in West Wales, the bones just rotted away very quickly in the acid soils that cover most of Wales. Back in 1924, an excavation by Alfred Badger and Francis Green revealed the chapel's stone walls, and a small dig in the 1970s discovered five skeletons, some in coffin-like stone boxes called kist graves. But following the 2014 storms, David Archaeological Trust partnered with the University of Sheffield to begin the site's largest excavation to date. They knew the chapel and the burials were waiting for them, but what they eventually uncovered would make the St Patrick's Chapel site one of Wales's most important archaeological discoveries. So in 2014, we carried out a two-week excavation in partnership with the University of Sheffield. One of the first things we found was not a human skeleton, but parts of a car which had been dumped on the site in the 60s and 70s in an attempt to try and halt erosion, which was quite bad at that time. And hints of things to come were evident then. We had mixed up with bits of car parts, bits of human bone, which suggested lower down we were going to get quite a few burials. After our initial work in 2014, we realised there was an awful lot more to the site than was then evident in that two-week excavation. So we returned in 2015 and 2016 do some more work and then we were able to come back in 2019 and 2021 with funding from the Ancient Connections project to do a very comprehensive excavation.
the excavation discovered three phases of the site's history, spanning around 450 years, from AD 750 to AD 1200. First to be revealed was the chapel itself, but below that was a cemetery containing 250 bodies, and below that, even more secrets were waiting, along with an exciting discovery that would give the whole project a very human connection to the past. Uh, in the upper levels, one of the first things we encountered were the remains of a stone-built chapel, St. Patrick's Chapel, probably built in the 11th century. It was a small structure but well built, but it had been repaired and restored many, many times during its lifetime. And one of the things that they had done was block up the west-facing entrance and create a new doorway in the south wall. And the reason for this is that windblown sand was constantly blown to the chapel, just blocking up the doorway in the inside with sand. And one of the interesting finds we had from the site, which was just outside the chapel itself, was a small bronze pin made in Dublin, the 11th century. The chapel, however, wasn't the end of the story. It had been built on top of a cemetery, a place where bodies had been buried over a period of around 300 years. Towards the end of the 8th century, a cemetery was laid out. A substantial wall was built as a cemetery enclosure and the first burials began to appear. Uh, but as time went on, the windblown sand buried this wall and also buried the earliest burials. And as more sand came in, more burials were put in the ground and more sand and more burials until eventually that wall disappeared beneath sand. The earliest graves were simple east-west aligned graves, uh, mostly of children, in fact just of infants and foetuses. Uh, we don't know the reason why it should be, but it does seem as a desire to, to bury young children on the site in this very early period. It may be it's unconsecrated ground and therefore people can bury these very unbaptized children there. What it does show though quite clearly is a very high level of infant mortality in this period. Alternatively, it may well be we're looking at just a part of the site and maybe other elements which we're not seeing we do have adult burials as well as children in them. The sand continued to accumulate across the site throughout the 8th and 9th centuries, with layer after layer of graves dug into it. Later burials include both adults and children. Some were unusual. There's one we thought was buried in a bag, and others were buried face down. The reason for this is uncertain, but it may well be they're particularly devout individuals in a prostrate position or it could be they are of dubious character, hence buried face down. As the sand accumulated, new burials took place on top of older graves, and some of the older skeletons were displaced. By the end of the 9th century, only the tops of the cemetery wall were visible, and the cemetery itself expanded beyond the original enclosure. As the first time we get kiss graves begin to appear, some of these had crosses lightly scratched onto the lintel stones, one had a cross, a cross stone placed by the head of an infant. At another grave, they find one, had an upright cross placed at the head of the grave and a foot stone at the foot end. Uh, and some of the later graves had uh, quartz pebbles or limpet shells placed on top of them so they've been visible to visitors to the site. In 2019, the team was back again and finally the earliest structures could be revealed. Deeply buried in the sand, we found an oval enclosure with central rectangular structure. Outside the enclosure was evidence of craft production. We were making small bronze objects and also objects of amber. We also found some glass beads of a type which can be matched with ones found in Ireland. Closer examination of the rectangular structure revealed markings scratched into the stone, mostly by unskilled hands. At one end, there was a fine interlaced Celtic cross design. There were several unusual markings on the centre stone. Among them, a figure with hands raised in the Oran's praying position. Alongside this figure was a checkerboard pattern and several other distinctive markings, and an inscription that has so far proved illegible. Another stone had a simple cross scratched into its surface. These markings are fascinating, but the site had a further secret to reveal. 
At one end of the structure, on an upright slab, the team found these marks. A wave-like symbol, a boat, and an inscription reading Donawek. This is an unusual and special find. The boat, the little drawing of the boat, the spire which may be a wave, indicates perhaps some sort of sea travel. The name itself, uh, Donawek, either means or could mean noble youth or dark warrior, or it could mean the infant Don. We don't really know much about him, but it is an Irish name of the 8th century. Uh, is this person, is this a memorial to him? who was perhaps lost at sea, or is it in fact just someone who visited the site, perhaps from Ireland, and left his name scratched upon this rectangular structure. The structure's function isn't certain, though it resembles the yechta of the west of Ireland. A yecht is a small structure found on early medieval Christian sites, typically made from rough, unmortared stones. They may have marked burials, though there's no such burial at White Sands, or served as a site for prayer or devotion. This was a place where grave was dug upon grave, up to 12 layers of bodies. But why were so many young people buried at this site? Did the yecht, if that's what it was, make this spot so important that it became a natural location for a cemetery and then a chapel, even as the sand continued to blow in? And why was the chapel eventually abandoned, probably around the early 1500s? Why was it left to decay? Why was it left to the endless encroachment of that ever-drifting, wind-blown sand? The work we've done so far tells a huge amount about the people who were buried at St Patrick's Chapel. And that's not the end of the story. There's still an awful lot more analysis to do. In particular, looking at the human remains of the 250 skeletons we found at the site. And Dr Katie Hamer of University College London is examining these, as well as looking at the physical remains. We're looking at the ancient DNA and also what's called isotopic analysis, which tells us about the people, the lives of people, the diet of people, where they came from, and to some cases, how they died. So the story continues. It will be several years before this work is completed. So many questions remain, but as work continues, it seems certain that we'll soon learn much more. Because while this White Sands beach site is now a favorite spot for holidays and picnics, Don Oek and those who came after him have made sure it has even richer stories to tell.